Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Writer for Wired magazine, Andy Greenberg is author of Sandworm, a new era of cyber war and the hunt for the Kremlin's most dangerous hackers. Three years ago, Greenberg learned of a group of hackers hitting Ukraine with relentless, what he calls disruptive cyber attacks with effects that would soon spread globally, as we well know today. His book tells that story of the first true cyber war. As Russia has attacked, Greenberg has not been far behind, reporting on these incursions and wired while searching for their perpetrators. Like the best true crime writing, his narrative is both perversely entertaining and terrifying, says the New York Review of Books. And longtime national security advisor Richard Clark adds about Greenberg's book, it's an in-depth investigation of what the Russian military's best cyber unit has already done to disrupt corporations, to penetrate utilities, and to prepare for all-out cyber war. It considers, too, how we might counter the Kremlin in the future, and it couldn't be a timelier conversation to have, at least not ever, I hope, timelier than today, because then we might be in the midst of a full-scale digital Pearl Harbor or digital 9-11. And so I hope... Hopefully is, not too timely. Right, right. right. Ho yeah. Hopefully it doesn't get any timelier. Exactly. Um, but I want you to start with the history of what preempted, um, what occurred prior to the influence on the American campaign and the attacks, the, the bots and the trolls and the, the espionage that occurred during the 2016 cycle, because the precursor to that, as I said in the intro, is Ukraine. What happened in Ukraine? In many ways, this book is about how Ukraine is this canary in the coal mine, that you can look to Ukraine to see the future and to see very specifically what Russia is planning, what, what, what Russia is trying to carry out in its kind of most insidious and aggressive maneuvers. So um, I think as you were alluding to, um, before even the real story of this book could get started, um, just after the pro-Western revolution that happened in Ukraine in, in early 2014, um, this kind of moment when Ukraine tore away from the influence of, of, its, of its Russian neighbors to the east and tried to embrace the EU. Um, well, Russia invaded and seized Crimea and then began this uh, sort of touched off a, um, a Russian-supported civil war in the east of Ukraine. But they also began to carry out wave after wave of cyber attacks. And the very first of those was actually an attempt to hack the Ukrainian election. Uh, so um, Russian hackers, we would later learn that they uh, were, in fact, the same Russian hackers who meddled in the U.S. election, who hacked the DNC, the DCCC, uh, the Clinton campaign. They tried to spoof the results of the Ukrainian election by hacking into the Central Election Commission and um, adding uh, fake results that they that were actually then trumpeted on Russian television, even though the Ukrainian um, television station managed to take them down before they could be broadcast in Ukraine. So it was clear that there was some coordination there. Um, when I began looking at Ukraine, actually um, I w in late 2016, after the Russian attempts to interfere in the U.S. election, I saw that as maybe the, the, the first sign that you could see the future by looking at Ukraine. You could see how Russia was testing out new 
cyber war and information warfare capabilities in Ukraine. Uh, and what was really chilling was that, well, first you could see that Russia had hacked the Ukrainian election, then they, by then, had already tried to hack our election, I think you can say. But they had also hacked so many other things in Ukraine, including even the power grid, causing the first ever blackouts triggered by hackers. So did that mean that Russia was building a capability there that they also would use elsewhere in the world, just as they had with their election meddling techniques? Um, you know, was, was, were those Ukrainian blackouts a kind of um, harbinger of similar cyber attacks on electric utilities elsewhere in the world or the, a capability that Russia was trying to develop? It seemed like Ukraine was being used as a kind of test lab for cyber war and capabilities that really threaten everyone in, in the West and elsewhere. I love that line from the Americans, and we hosted Joe Weisberg, of course, the creator and writer of The Americans on, when there's a military officer who, to whom it's explained looking at code, that's what the future of the free world rests on, that code. It seems at least ostensibly like the Russians decided amidst this kind of nuclear detente and deterrent that this is, the, this is where the future is. Well, as you were saying, we don't see much of the same kind of, uh, you know, the NSA and Cyber Command, U.S. forces hacking in the same um, sort of like massively disruptive ways. If they're doing it, we don't know about it. They do it occasionally. They, you know, Stuxnet, this piece of code in, in 2009, 2010, was this kind of brilliance um, designed tool that the NSA and Israeli forces together used to you know, dis destroy Iranian centrifuges right. um, to pr prevent them from developing a nuclear weapon. But that's a very rare and also very, very targeted sort of cyber attack. What we've seen from Russia and beginning in Ukraine have been wave after wave of very loud, um, massively destructive attacks that have destroyed the entire networks of media companies, private sector, industry, government agencies, and culminated in not one but two attacks on U the Ukrainian power grid that turned off the power to hundreds of thousands of people. These are the kind of quintessential acts of mass cyber war that we've been waiting for, for, you know, really sort of dreading and writing sort of science fictional hypothetical stories about for decades. And that happened in Ukraine, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, you know, this, this book is about the fact that we should have seen those attacks happening right. in Ukraine, said I, I, uh, that told Russia, this is unacceptable. These sorts of cyber attacks on civilian targets are never acceptable. These are essentially cyber war crimes. And yet we said nothing. And that allowed Russia to keep going. It gave them this implicit signal that they could escalate, which they did. And ultimately, those attacks spread to the rest of the world. Right. And, and of course, you had a presidential candidate at that point encouraging the hacking if you're listening, please hack into the DNC. Please recover emails from Hillary Clinton. So we, we ought not ever forget that there was complicity right. in the perpetuation of those attacks. Absolutely. The Obama administration, it's, I feel like I need to say to be fair, um, responded to Russia's attacks on the U.S. election, but did not respond to the attacks on Ukraine. And even when they were the kind of most obvious crossing of red lines that we should have been trying to set, like nobody should turn off the power to civilians with a cyber attack. The Obama administration said nothing about that. It's not um, clear but, that but, they had the foresight either. That, right, exactly. Right. But then those attacks continued under the Trump administration. And it seems like um, there, there's a different motivation, which is that uh, the, the Trump White House doesn't uh, like to talk about Russian hackers for obvious reasons. They are, Trump himself seems to be incredibly sensitive to any suggestion, any mention of Russian hacking, uh, so, and also very isolationist in his views. So when those attacks continued in, in Ukraine, it's no surprise that the Trump White House also said nothing, even as those attacks escalated, even as the warning became clearer and clearer that things were happening in Ukraine that would soon hit us in the U.S. as well. And, and what I mean by that is not just election hacking, I should be clear. Sure but a very specific cyber attack that these same hackers, known as Sandworm, that's why this is the title of my book, um, that these same hackers unleashed in Ukraine and that very literally spread a worm that spread to the rest of the world and 
caused $10 billion in damage, uh, took down American hospitals' medical record systems, shut down Maersk, the world's largest shipping firm, and Merck, uh, a New Jersey pharmaceutical company. I, well, maybe we'll get to this, but um, this is the kind of climactic attack that fulfilled this prediction, this warning that what happened in Ukraine should not be ignored, that it would happen to us too, and it did in, in 2017. Do you expect, as we anticipate this fall's campaign, that they will, the Russian-inspired and active measures against American democracy will be in even more brutal force than in 2016, that it will materialize in the way you describe to intimidate voters? I, I think it's, it's a, maybe um, a foolish game to try to predict what uh, Russian hackers will do because they seem to thrive on unpredictability, doing something different from what they did last time, um, doing the unexpected. Uh, it does seem likely that uh, we'll at least see the same kind of influence operations, information warfare that we saw in, in 2016. Um, I th but you can also see the ways that, that Russia, more specifically with this group Sandworm, which uh, to kind of maybe spoil some of the surprises in the book, is a part of the military intelligence agency, the GRU, the same one that meddled in the 2016 election. We see how they're developing ways of not just um, trying to sway public opinion, disinformation, hacking and leaking operations, dirty politics. They're doing, uh, Sandworm is doing disruptive attacks that break pieces of our society, of uh, you know, Ukraine's critical infrastructure that shut down massive networks. And Th that's I think what I mean. A, there's, a, there's a fear, yeah. I think, that what you're getting at is yeah. that there's a fear that those sorts of attacks could be launched, for instance, on Election Day in 2020. And what would it look like if there were, you know, uh, perhaps uh, big attacks on the U.S. media that uh, destroyed hundreds or thousands of computers, as has happened in Ukraine on the day of the election. That, exact, that actually happened in Ukraine. Uh, Russian hackers, Sandworm, uh, attacked uh, Ukrainian television broadcasters on the day of an election. Mm -hmm. That could happen in the U.S. We could see, I, I don't want to be a scaremonger here, and it's difficult, it's dangerous to predict, but we could see blackouts or a disruptive worm that spread, you know, wantonly through American networks destroying computers on election day. What would that mean for voter turnout, for the distraction of the of U.S. citizens on this crucial day? That's what I was going to get at, though, which is we ought to expect that they're going to do a number on the Biden emails or the Buttigieg emails or whoever the eventual Democratic nominee right, is. Right. The, you know, uh, we absolutely should expect that every campaign will be targeted by Russian hackers, probably Chinese hackers, probably plenty of foreign states hackers, um, at least as an espionage target. I think we can also expect that, that uh, there will be some sort of repeat of 2016 where those espionage campaigns escalate into hacking and leaking operations right. where, you know, with false identities, hackers uh, just spill out the guts of these campaigns in embarrassing ways or, you know, maybe with uh, disinformation, fake emails thrown in to try to sway public opinion. We saw that in the French election in 2017 as well, also with the same hackers involved. But the DHS, you know, Reuters has reported uh, that the DHS is trying to prepare for um, a more disruptive and destructive kind of cyber attack on the 2020 election as well. Um, it, it, perhaps that could target election infrastructure. Right. We could see like some sort of disruption campaign against voter rolls. Right. Sandworm did also in 2016 breach states' uh, boards of election that includes voter rolls. So that could be a way to affect turnout. But there could also be something you know, less direct, something that simply you know, just shuts down lots of U.S. infrastructure on that day. The DHS is trying to prepare for that too, but that is a, that is a vast target to try to put a shield around. I'm not sure it's really possible to prepare when, you know, we're talking about trying to, pr to protect essentially everything at the same time. I mean, uh, we can't simply just like lift the cybersecurity of the entire U.S. private sector and government um, to prepare for 2020. Doesn't this get back to the motive 
the question of motive and the GRU and Putin, who, from what we gather, is the puppet master of the GRU. And, you know, it, it doesn't benefit him, ultimately, to turn off the lights completely of the global economy, I don't think. I don't think that that's... Uh, if you watch Icarus, um, which is sort of the companion documentary on Netflix to your terrific book, Sandworm, you'll see that there was an animus that was a result of American interference and allegiance to Ukraine. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm wondering, Andy, you know, is there even an effort at that level to understand motive? It's interesting that you sort of pair Icarus yeah. and Sandworm. Icarus, you know, um, Brian Fogel's Icarus is really about um, Russia's obsession with the Olympics. And my book is, is in part, it's actually, there are some parts about that, but it's um, kind of about Russia's other obsession, which is Ukraine. Right. Um, and, and it seems like those obsessions are not entirely rational, and they lead to um, maneuvers to attacks that are not always even, you know, sort of strategically smart for Russia to do. For um, In Ukraine in 2017, this kind of climactic attack I was getting at, this is called NotPetya. Um, Sandworm, these, this group of Russian hackers that's part of the GRU, the military intelligence agency, unleashed a worm that spread to the rest of the world, cost $10 billion in damage, and it actually hit Russian companies as well. It was so reckless in its automated spreading from network to network and the damage that it did that it, it was entirely indiscriminate and untargeted. It hit the U.S., it hit all over Europe, and it hit Russia, as well as you know, carpet bombing the Internet of Ukraine, which was its actual intention. So I don't believe that that was intended to to do millions, at least, of dollars in damage to Russia as well. It seems like um, the GRU in particular, this one intelligence agency that is tasked with these insanely aggressive um, you know, sorts of attacks, the GRU is responsible for that, for NotPetya, for these attacks on Ukraine. Sandworm is part of the GRU. They have almost, it seems like, a sort of cowboy mentality that you just every day try to do the most uh, scary and aggressive thing you can think of to impress your bosses, maybe to impress your boss's boss, or maybe to impress Putin himself. And you don't always think about the consequences. Uh, but to more directly sort of tie into what you're saying, I think that in 2018, Sandworm, all, the GRU again, attacked the 2018 Olympics too, with a cyber attack that essentially destroyed the IT back end of the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. Um, you know, this is where Icarus and Sandworm really good. You know, the, 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 these obsessions, Ukraine and the Olympics, they are often tied together. Uh, and that attack, in that attack, Sandworm tried to cover its tracks to make the attack look like it could be China or it could be North Korea with all these false flags. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't try to take credit for it. They didn't try to send a message. So I, you can see almost the pettiness of this, that Russia had been banned from those Olympics for doping. And they just wanted to spoil it for everyone else. They didn't really want to accomplish anything tactically or to give themselves some advantage to, you know, try to remove that ban or get into the next Olympics. They just wanted to take revenge anonymously. So it's, it's really difficult to understand the motivations of the GRU, of Putin. It seems like sometimes it's just almost emotional and it's sort of petty vindictiveness. While it is emotionally charged, I think from the American perspective, there is a rational end goal for them to destabilize democratic norms and to, in effect, normalize autocracy in the United States. And that's why they favor Trump. And I, Yeah, I think that know, the 2016 election hacking was more rational, right. was more strategic. And it worked. So, so, so in that yeah. vein, when, when we're aware of the threat and the perpetrator, how brazen do you think it will get? We were talking about scenarios where they are cutting voters off the rolls or leading to, to blackouts, um, cutting the electricity. In, uh, I could imagine that being a next step in these districts where they're cyber warriors were sending Facebook posts and tweets out that said, you can text your vote to, and they did that specifically targeting low information voters in, you know, certain localities. And I, 
I, do you think it will get that that brazen and and obvious to the point of of shutting down the power grid where Trump's opponents and and voters for Trump's opponent would come out? Do you think? Well, I I think we can we can look at 2016 where they did pretty insanely brazen sorts of uh, hacking and leaking influence operations, disinformation, and they got away with it in the sense that you know our administration. Um, now has downplayed it, has denied it, has, we've failed to respond in many ways. I mean, half the country is massively inflamed about this, but the, uh, the party in power is doing everything it can to downplay that. So uh, I do think that invites even more aggressive tactics of those kinds in 2020. Will they try some sort of more disruptive attack that, you know, uh, deletes voter rolls or messes with reg you know, voter registration systems that um, destroys computer networks or causes a blackout. I don't know if they'll go that far. We've seen that <clears throat> Russian hackers, including Sandworm, have at some points um, planted their malware in American grid targets. Uh, and in 2017, a different Russian hacker group um, got, got far enough as to be taking screenshots to have access to the control panel software, they could have started flipping switches. They probably could have caused, at the very least, a very short-term blackout, and they didn't. So there is, um, you know, that's both extremely worrying, but it also shows that Russian hacking forces have some restraint when it comes to these very obvious and sort of like uh, quintessential acts of cyber war against the U.S. They haven't gone that far in the past, um, but I, I just. I wouldn't want to bet that they will never take that step because they simply are so, so kind of um, macho, brazen, driven, it seems, by ego. And um, if, for instance, there was ever a perception that the U.S. had done this to Russia or done something equivalent, I can see them firing back. If you were game playing this, Andy, based on your terrific research, what would you expect ultimately transpires in Tokyo? And, and does that set up expectations for what happens in November? What's important to look at as the pattern, uh, uh, if we're going to look at the Olympics. So in 2018, ahead of the 2018 Olympics, GRU hackers, um, this group known as Fancy Bear, that was also responsible for, for some of those um, attacks on the DNC and the Clinton campaign that stole and leaked emails, they, that same hacker group, which is part of the GRU, all of this is part of the GRU, they also stole and leaked emails from the Worldwide Anti-Doping Agency to try to discredit that group ahead, you know, um, in retaliation for the, their doping ban against Russia. Um, that happened ahead of the 2018 Olympics, on the day of the Olympics. And in fact, at the moment that the opening ceremony began, Sandworm, this other arm of the GRU, launched a sabotage attack that destroyed the IT back end of those Olympics, forced these poor Korean IT administrators to spend the next 12 hours, that entire night, um, trying to rebuild the entire Olympics network from scratch, essentially, so that the games could begin at 8 a.m. the next day. And they just barely succeeded at that. It was a kind of heroic effort. But since then, since that attempted cyber sabotage on the Pyeongchang Olympics, there's been no government statement in the West, the U.S. government has not said that Russia did this officially, which is just inexplicable. And I would say almost, you know, just appalling negligence. And who has and said it? No one has really. I mean, the, you, um, you do. I, I have said it. In fact, this, you know, my book includes, I think, some um, new evidence that proves that it was, in fact, Sandworm responsible for this. I, I shouldn't say no one. The Washington Post reported a couple of weeks after the attack that it was the GRU that had done this, but without any evidence. What about the Olympics or uh, doping committees? Google has also said yeah. that um, Sandworm did this cyber attack uh -huh. on the 2018 Olympics. Uh -huh. But uh, the fact that no government has called right. this out means that they're inviting another attack in 2020. Right. And in fact, we've seen the precursors to that attack in 2020 already beginning. We've seen GRU hackers stealing, uh, targeting the Worldwide Anti-Doping Agency again, uh, which, you know, so we're seeing the same pattern play out, and we have not done the diplomacy, the kind of um, discipline, disciplined response necessary to try to prevent Russia from carrying out another potentially catastrophic attack. And most depressingly, I'll just say to end, 
that Robert Mueller is not home anymore, right? I mean, there, there was this faith that he would protect us as it related to the collusion, but the fact of the matter is he, he you know, there, there is no active, at least publicly known, active law enforcement czar that is leading these efforts. And, you know, Robert Mueller might have gone away, but all of those threats, the fancy bears and um, the sandworms, they remain. And, and you know, to me, his um, concluding act and testimony before Congress uh, just was a concession almost to, to the idea that that was the new normal and you know, those crimes were committed. We, we haven't extradited anyone. We haven't gotten real justice. And your final thoughts? Well, Robert Mueller um, did, I believe, the best job of anybody so far to actually hold some of these hackers to account. But he was focused on U.S. election interference. He did indict uh, 12 GRU hackers in absentia. You know, we're right. not going to get our hands on those guys. Um, they included some members of Sandworm, it turned out. But Robert Mueller, you know, wasn't his job, and in fact, it has sort of been nobody's job. We don't have somebody whose job it is to, to try to um, police the activity of these hackers more broadly. We, we not only are not protecting American interests, we are not protecting uh, targets, civilian targets like the Olympics. We are not setting kind of global cyber norms about what is okay to do in cyber war and what is not. We need a kind of Geneva Convention to make those rules, and we're not even close to one right now. We hope that Christopher Ray, FBI director, is at work on this, and I'm sure there are people behind the scenes who are working on this, or at least we, we ought to hope. Andy, thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash Open Mind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, Lawrence B. Benenson, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America.